Optigonda Gitchen and Mount PBA Yaya, Gawed Noden Digo, Minnesota, Shawanong, Nongwa, Onjibaya, Tijajago, Nok Misabonik, Moni Young, Mina Chionagaming, Gionjibawat. It's wonderful to be here in this space, in this city. I come here as often as I can. And it's also much the way that you mentioned. Is it loud enough? You got it? Or not loud enough? Here, I should just hold it because that's what it will come to. Is that better? Okay, so the people in the back need to give me a signal if it's not. So it's, it's really nice to be up here in Winnipeg from Minnewaking. It's good to move around in this space. We were just mentioning before I started that there are 163 nations that use Anishinaabemwin, um, and it's good to see that it is being used increasingly. Uh, for me, it's a special treat always to be up in this area, uh, and I think that the fact that we have this recorded, I will try to do my very best and dedicate this, this one to my dad, who just had his birthday this week. And I really think it was his encouragement over many, many years to listen to the land, listen to the trees, and start thinking in ways that we, we know are indigenous to this place. So the, um, for me, it is going to be much easier to share looking at this with you trying to make sure our friends who are doing the recording know where I'm at. <laughs> so Gijigijiganeshi Gikendan, what the chickadee knows, uh, is really about how I try to mix the knowledge of science and philosophy in English. We have separate ways of talking about these, but you find through the language, through our stories, um, through the culture in this place, that you can find another way to understand these things. So, if I move it, right. So, you can see that even from outer space, you can recognize where the Great Lakes are, and so we know where that home territory is of the people who have been here for so long. And I put this poem first because it's one that I think gets at some of the ways we might begin thinking about the topics of philosophy, spirituality, linguistics, all of those things. And for this talk, what I thought would just be useful and interesting is to share with you some of the stories of these poems that I've written. Poems aren't necessarily something traditional that we would say we find in uh, the native literature volumes that we might have. There might be some old Densmore recordings, some bits of ethnography, but what we have to do as we move forward in the contemporary world is write and be creative and use our language in all of the ways that are out there. So I'm definitely writing contemporary poems using the language that I teach. I'm not trying to do something that would be similar to something done hundreds of years ago. So this, this one is, Dibike bagone a temegat, bakan, bogadakaming, kinagoji, ngawin, ngoji, zagigi, zagakaki, epichi, bongi, shimot, gimbiska, bimin, api, nagamo yang, gne begok, gon, tigwanan, miguanak, neboka yang, abanuji yang, nebayang, wabanoanang, mashko, bike yang. And just thinking about the ways that I can write first in Anishinaabe one and play with those sounds throughout all of these, the reasons that I wanted to have them here for you to see, you can read the English, and I try to make it close because I know I have other teachers and speakers in the room who will say, it doesn't exactly match if I don't get it to match, but you can see that the Anishinaabe one was the thing that's privileged here. So the sounds, you have echoes in the Anishinaabe one, and you have things that are on on that side of the page that you're looking at here that represent the language much better. The English, I try to get it accurate, but it's not going to have the same repetition and patterns. So I have a couple of things that I just wanted to share about the language itself. These might be things that many people in the room already know, but I often find that they're things that just by using our language, we teach people these things. Our language is mostly verbs. The language that we're using in this space is one of action. It's one of talking about what you see happening, being present in a space, and learning how to describe that. Many stories from different angles, both versions that I've seen of Genesis that are translated and things that I've heard in Lodge stories talk about energy being the core of our ideas. And so thinking about how that central idea of energy 
defines the world and our attempt to describe where that energy goes in the world is really what a lot of our science and philosophy is based on. Um, I will also say to folks in this room, because as a student of Anishinaabe Mwen for many, many years, and you think you always remain a student, it made me crazy when I felt I had to write everything down. If anyone wants me to send this to them later, just let me know so you don't feel like you have to write it down. Um, uh, so you can describe all these relationships. We have things that our language tells us that are meaningful and build connection. So when we are using this language, the speech that we are using is setting up relations and tracing patterns that we see in the world around us. So for example, you can hear parts of words that echo across things and say more than maybe just that word itself. So zaga'igan, one of my personal favorites, early on I taught both of my daughters to say gizagin. Now, as they're teenagers, I have to remind them and I say, it's not enough to just say, you love someone, you have to ask, do they love themselves? And then we might talk about the lake, again. What you hear in those words, I can't say there's a connection between the word for lake and the word for love, but when I use both words and speak Anishinaabe when I connect to space and place differently than when I do with English. So I think that's where you move from linguistics into poetry, from science into art. And we're always, I think, as human beings, we're moving back and forth in between those worlds when we're making meaning. So we have ideas in our words that are embedded in the language there. This was just another way to say that this language is very different than English. Uh, again, this might be things that people up in this territory definitely know, but there's seven pronouns. You have to think about how those are different in a in language classroom where people may have been focused on, do I say he or she or they? You can just say ween in Anishinaabe. When you have to decide, though, whether when you say we, you mean we just us, not including who you're talking to, or whether you mean we everybody. Those are differences that once someone learns the language, whether they're learning it as kindergartners in an immersion setting or even before that in a daycare, they start to internalize making these designations clear, thinking about the relationship and making those clear when they speak. And even as an adult, when you go back to learn these things, you start realizing this is a different way to talk. I have to be careful of different edges. It's not that one is better or worse than the other. It's that you just have to be mindful of different relationships. So the idea of us having a central verb in action in the middle of our statement and then adding to that is another thing that we see in the language. Um, the first person, if I say I, I'm including people, I'm always sort of radiating out. So these are just differences between English and Anishinaabe when um, I think the other one that really causes some people stumbling blocks is the idea of whether something is animate or inanimate. Um, I have actually known adults who said, that's where I stopped trying to learn the language. I couldn't figure that out. And, and the sad thing about that is I've seen really amazing fluent elders who talk about something as if it's inanimate, and in the very next sentence they talk about it as if it's animate. So I think our really strong speakers have shown us that rather than tell everybody what's right or wrong, that we give people tools and then they describe the world around them. So whether you're talking about, for instance, an example I often use with students, you might see two kids throwing stones on a playground and I've seen elders say in the language, don't throw stones, and they're talking about them as if they're inanimate because those kids are just messing with something on a playground. I've seen the same people in the same, using their same dialect, go into a different setting where they would talk about a stone as animate. Um, I've seen stories be told where you move something from being animate to inanimate. What you don't do is use inanimate verbs with something that you think of as animate. So you just have to be consistent about how you perceive something and try to be clear. Rather than thinking there's only one way to do it, you have to just get familiar with the tools. So that, at least to me, has always been helpful for people to know. Um, to just, I guess, reiterate that, the idea of beige gwendon, where everybody has one way of thinking, which 
I hope that it's not offensive to say if there's any Haudenosaunee people in the room, feels a little Haudenosaunee to me, <laughs> which, is, which is okay. <laughs> it's just different, right? I mean, I think we have a system in Anishinaabe language use where it's a bit more anarchic. It's a bit more about empowering every individual to think in their own way and do no harm to others. Whereas you have some nations and confederacies and linguistic groups where the rules are different. There's more rules. Um, you have in many of those Iroquoian language, 94 pronominal pairs. I mean, that's very, very codified and very clear. It's just a different way of using language. So I think that's another thing that we need to keep in mind. Um, Anishinaabe philosophy and religion is really, I think, almost like physics more than anything else. In a lot of ways, that sense of describing and interacting with what you see in front of you is the goal. And people talk a lot about minobimadasiwin. It's something we all learn early. We learn to say to each other, ani ejibimadasi, and how to answer that. And then later we start thinking, what is the difference between madasi, to be just alive, versus bimadasi? What, what's implied by that? Is there momentum? Is there presence? And then if we add to that minobimadasi, or we continue to describe, it's such a nice, way to just begin thinking about how do we continually elaborate what it is we see around us. So just to share my little perspective on things, I think in language revitalization, we have a lot of good leaders who have done many amazing things. Tabas Anakut is one that we knew well in Gakabikong as well, you know, in the Minneapolis region. Um, and each person sort of has a different role, and I can't speak for what other people would do and how they would go about it, and everybody has their own projects, which is excellent, because we see that web of language revitalization, I think, getting denser and more connected, and there's more and more happening. My little role has always been the sort of poetry, thinking about song, thinking about the way science and art connect. The first book that I wrote, Bawajimo, was really about how we see storytellers who are predominantly, for one reason or another, either they lost use of Anishinaabemwin or they have still retained their use of Anishinaabemwin, but there's no venue to publish or write in Anishinaabemwin. So whether you're Louise Erdrich or whether you were Basil Johnston, they were writing in English. So Bawajimo was looking at how Anishinaabe authors use language when they felt they could, how much of it they thought they could, and what it meant to be writing as an Anishinaabe storyteller, but writing in English. And then Weweni, which I often say is probably the more significant thing to have gotten done, but the much thinner, smaller book, is a group of poems that are all in Anishinaabe went first and then translated in English. And I always enjoy the irony that it is published by Wayne State University Press. If you have time to kill, look up who Anthony Wayne was, and I hope it disturbs him that we've got the language still being spoken, because <laughs> he was... Uh, someone that did a great deal to uh, erase uh, indigenous presence, culture, and language in really the whole, you know, eastern part of the U.S. But uh, it's amazing to see even institutions with complex, very difficult histories, and this nation up here is far more a leader in this area, have started to ask questions, have started to say, well, we can publish things that in the past would not have been on our agenda, that people would have been told that's just not broadly meaningful. That's shifting a little bit. So um, that's a little bit about those two. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go through some things, just make sure that you get to hear poems. So this is a bit about the freshwater watershed in a way, what I think that it reminds us. The, the Great Lakes have been here after the Ice Age. There are Anishinaabek stories that talk about the Ice Age, there's a sense of that in memory, and th that happened anywhere between 10 and 12,000 years ago, but it really shapes this space. So when it's, uh, whether it's the large lakes up here just north of the Great Lakes system or the, the Great Lakes that are interconnected themselves, it really defines who people are here. So I'll read this one, which is uh, about Chigaming. Chigaming, gi Mikwan abikwan dana, neashewan, neakobiwanan, neakwa, bindik zagaganing, a gwajing a king, 
Oma, Jawenegejik, Jawenemongwa, E Pichi, E Guayashkang, Midash, Anamashkak, Gae, Baswewe, Jibimarsiang, Mampi, Gedanishana, Bemtagonanik, Ginwensh, Bibun, Nitawigang, Nibing, Be Bejian, Jasemagok, Apane. So just thinking about the ways that this space shapes time and has shaped the land, and in many ways I think people are being reminded that our resilience and ability to be in this space is heavily dependent on the water and land itself to be healthy. And it will sort of have its way, whether we are erasing swamp areas, whether we are polluting the water, there are consequences, there's balance, there's gonna be things that come as a result of that. Um, this is another one where uh, I guess I would have to credit Rita Sands of Bekejwanong, uh, who often would sing a little song to my daughters, which was just, wingush, wingush, oh, zhao squa, which is just a way to remember the word for sweetgrass and the word for green. But she was very careful to always remind us that the word for green was then the same for blue. So traditionally, even though now in our kindergarten board books we have one word for blue and one word for purple and one word for green, because we try to create parallels so that kids feel that their language is somewhat equivalent in, in many ways, but that old concept of ojaushkwa being that whole range of blue to green, and you think, well, what does that really mean? But if you're out near the Great Lakes and you look at the lake and you look at the sky, and for those of us in Wisconsin, you look at Green Bay or you look at the farm runoff, you, you know, you start to see what all of this means and why one would have to pay attention to this. So this one is ojaushkwazo, nambik jibwa mino coming, mishibiju on dawe. Api gizis zagiasage, giskang o jaushkwande, babin sikawagan, biskang o jaushkwande, nitta nimit, nitta gibi wazot, ashamat, ashamat, gijigak, dibkak, zagiasiminjimike, migoshka jiat akinan, bashkag buanit. So just thinking about, okay, I guess it would depend who the audience is, and now you can have a whole conversation about photosynthesis, which we don't have time for here, but our words get us to think about some of these ideas as we are teaching them. So as teachers of the language, what's happening in our classroom is often more than the thing right in front of us. So you're mindful that what you're giving people is really sort of a bundle of knowledge that they may unpack, you know, years from now when it's not the classroom anymore. Um, so this one is one for uh, Sturgeon are one of my favorite fish, but it was also uh, kind of based on ideas of transferability. So I have a lot of students who say, I'm a political science major, I'm a business major, my nation needs me to study finance, and, and that's absolutely true. And I still would say they should all take the language class, and in that, they'll find things relevant. So this was one that was sort of about a conversation at, that we had after class about ideas of leadership, leadership which would be, what does it mean in a society where you really don't want to be putting yourself above others? How do you lead then? How do you figure out when somebody needs to go in a position on a path or in a direction or to take a role in a group? How does that ebb and flow of leadership take shape? Um, so, nita niganit. Niganin e jimokdaman mikwam jiwitamiskwe jabose Nisadotan, Ginuibane Gade, Gae Gawin, Gashkio Sian, Abagayan, Gikendan, Anamindim, Anjasemagat, Ningoding, Aguatewin, Awit Gigun. So when we think of in our lakes, we can see who are the leaders in different parts of the lake, um, in different activities that occur there. In most spaces, there are either species or individual people or plants that are key to some particular process. The trick is to remember that there are other processes that they also depend on where they are 
not the key. They are not the leaders. And I think as people talk about ideas like the Anthropocene and what's going on with our you know, changes in economy and agriculture, how we see these networks and how we start seeing that humans perhaps need to recognize their role and listen a little better, you know, that some of this is things that you might find in the language. So knowing that I'm halfway through, I'll go move along. So this one, I think it was also nice to think of the Weweni series and the reminder that it is based on how families continue stories. So for me, my daughters are a, a huge part of everything that I do. So Don Suck, this is one that I had written for them because they are very fond of the notion that otters can swim around and fall asleep and move through the water while holding hands. <laughs> but it also made me think about what does it mean as daughters, as children, as children that all of us might share together, that whole next generation that we're collectively responsible for. What do we owe them? I realize this one, you don't have the English on here, so I'll read it and then I'll show you the English and, and pause for a second. So this one is... Nindan suck. Apane Giranokashiman Dibishko Nigik Nijo Nijinwat Megwa Agwanjewat Enji Agamowat Gema Enjinibawat Misqueaben Gigi Mada Odeman Mi Nongwa Ejibimadzing Bizagwabin Minwa Basangwabing Agwabjigaying Bonskajigaying Api jagazagade gijigat, ishkode bingwan, jabosamang, jingop minan, mikamang, minwa misko min ojibkan, giga gekno ama winenum, eje nundwangedwa, manidok, eje biskamang, wasnode, eje anzin godizoyang dibkang, eje dabasenmoying bochigo, dibishko, bejik, mandomen, gizis, agogwaden, bakanzit, and then I'll show you the actual daughters <laughs> and the English. <laughs> um, and part of this was actually just thinking about what you do teach that next generation. How do you teach them the science you know, the share the experiences that you've had, and actually also let go of them a little bit now and then, right? So that's both of my daughters. So. Uh, Nitana Mikwezans is in the center there, Fiona, uh, Ann Arbor, dot Nongom. Mirash Nitana Mikwezans, Shannon, who, Manhattan, Kinomage, and Nongo. So she's currently teaching in Manhattan. And then this one is the Gijigiji Ganeshi and the art, the Gijigiji Ganeshi. Now I'm doing it right. The Gigi Gigi Ganeshi. So the Gigi Gigi Ganeshi, yuck, the plural, the three of them there, this art was drawn by Shannon, the one when you were looking at the one that teaches in Manhattan, Nitanami Quezans. So she uh, made the little cover for me. That'll be on the book. That'll come out. And this is one where when it was written, um, I had had a request for a song, and my dad is one who always listened to birds and always would tell us about birds. And in fact, when we were outside playing for too long, he had a certain call, a whistle that he would do, and we'd come back, and the other kids would think, what's that bird? We're like, no, it's dad. It's supper time, <laughs> you know? So this one comes out a bit as a song. Aniko bichikanak, aniko bidowat, wingash, windamawi yangidwa, gash kibichikek. Gashka king, get you get you Ganeshi. Hey, I go on duck, noon dog is it, noon demi young gidwa, monado king, monado weeing. So it's like a way of taking what we hear around us and remembering connections between generations. In this one, too, I was trying to make sure that we think about. Uh, you know, the idea of manado and what does that really mean and when are you making a ceremony and recognizing manados and when are people having to be spirited and recognize and find their own spirit. Um, and I think also the idea of the ankobjigan. So ankobjige, ankobidun, we have words that mean to literally physically connect. And then what does that mean when you have that is the word that you use for great grandparent and great grandchild? I mean, you have different words for your direct, your mishomis and your okmas, but to have this connection word as great grandparent and great grandchild, I think, says a lot as well. 
Um, I'm going to just go through some things quickly because I, I realize we want to make sure we finish on time. Uh, so this is a space that we all do not recognize on this map, but it's interesting to see that it's what others thought was reality at certain points in time. And I think especially up here where we are all more touched by the story of Hudson Bay than Columbus and the trade history, um, remembering that history and claiming it as our own is important. Not being pulled into some um, other story of this space. My classes have native and non-native students, and so we together have to think through what is that history of the space. And to just take the easy out of, well, there was colonization and Columbus, it's not true, and it covers up a lot of the reality. This was a little quote that I came across and then decided to write a bit of a, a poem about. Um, so Radisson, who wrote about the fact that he felt the squirrels had it in for him. Um, <laughs> I thought, you know, what would a beaver say about the history of colonization? So this is a poem about what I think the animals might have thought. In particular, a beaver might say, Gawin jichichingwang sewak, jachi bingwenjik, gawin gundan sinawa, beshgoejik, gawin mamanodendan sinawa, ojibkan eawang, gawin nisadotan sewa, so just thinking about what would it have been like to witness that and see huge depletion of your population and that kind of fury just unfolding around you. Um, just giving voice to what we know are animate parts of our world, but we don't usually take time to do that. Um, I will skip through things and we'll see. We can always circle back if we have time. So some of these others are just lessons in, in life. Um, this is one that was for a friend of mine. Uh, in Fond du Lac, Nagajiwanong, Ampawa Stewen, Pat Northrup, and she used to always make strawberry jam, and so it's another one where the tangible gift giving and recognizing what others do was what I wanted to put into the poem. And it's another one too that where it comes out more as a song. Um, Oh, day a mini bashkam and sigun ke gin a goin' at wish go on a mut was agame min a walk it buck on a book a bigish got de ba begin at gak in a gajaw and mongedwa gak in a gawani yongedwa nagamo and on wa nagamo young me guana qua was yongedwa. So just a song to give her back something for the jam and the stories and things that she had given me over the years. Um, I'm thinking we're getting close to time, so what I might want to do is go to this one because this is the interactive moment. You guys can all learn the song, right? I think you should. So this is my friend Kim Blazer, who Gawaba Biganika, Gonchabat, Minnesota, Minawakinomage, Awede, Minawakin, Wisconsin, Nonga. She's an amazing poet in her own right. She does incredible things. And we have friends that run a thing called the Overpass Light Brigade, where they make the big letters there. You could look them up. They're fascinating and they hold these big lit letters and they say things. We uh, had a mound that our state was going to eradicate and say that if people could prove that they could profit, then they could dig the mound up, which did not seem to make any sense. So all of us in Wisconsin a couple years ago had protests at our certain, at our mounds. So Kim and I just got folks together and our friends with the lights, they said, you need to remember. So Mikwenim is to remember someone that we should not be forgetting these mounds and why they're here. And we decided to make it a song. So I'll sing it. 
but you guys have the words, and I know some of you here are very good speakers. <laughs> and uh, and it's, if we go through it twice, you'll get it, right? Um, these are also, like this song and some of the other poems are on Ojibwe.net. This one's kind of sweet. Nitanamikwezants, uh, Fiona sings it with me on the recording on there. So it's always sort of a collective effort with these things. Gamekwanamego, Gizesejiz Agiasageyan. Gamekwanamego, Dipikit Gizes Babioyan. Mikwenda goes it up on a gosha. Mikwenda goes it up on a gosha. Gamekwanamegom. Aniko bijiganak, gumikwename gom, in a way maganak, mikwenda gozida upon a gosha, mikwenda gozida upon a gosha. Okay, now you all know it, no excuses, right? <laughs> Gumikwename go, Giza sejiz agia sageyan. Gumikwename go, Dipiki Gizes ba babioyan. Mikwenda goes it up on a gosha. Mikwenda goes it up on a gosha. Gumikwename go. Aniko bijiganak, gumikwename gom, in a way maganak, mikwenda gozida upon a gosha, mikwenda gozida upon a gosha. Ooh, wah, you guys did good. <laughs> so. So I can maybe like stop there and take questions um, because I just want it to feel like you heard some Anishinaabemwin. In this space, I really feel that everybody, this is so true, it's as so true in Winnipeg, Manitoba, as it is in Minnewaukee, Wisconsin. Everybody in those spaces, whether they are, you know, enrolled in a nation, whether they are descendants, whether they are mixed connected, and whether they are just in this space and don't have ethnic connections to it, we all share the, the language. I mean, I think it's something we should all hear. Um, so hopefully, if nothing else, I have achieved that. Uh, I can take questions if people have questions. Comments. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions? Yep. Am I going to give you the mic? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you also put audio to your resources to help with learners? Most of, like that song I just sang, it, you, it's, you can find it on here. Many of the poems from Weweni are on this website. The Gijigijiganeshi Gikendan I don't have on the site yet because that one I literally just sort of finished that book. So some of those poems are not on here yet. But we try to put this on here. So this is a website that um, my friend uh, Chitwa Dewegekwe, Stacy Sheldon, and Apuntz Pitawanakut, Alphonse from Wikwemakong. Um, we've been working on this site by almost 16 or 17 years now, and we've added a lot to it. So just over time, we put many, many songs and resources on here. And it's, people will find typos, and they should feel free to send those. We'll make corrections, and sometimes people ask for things. I have had people ask for teaching resources to go with things that they might be trying to teach. We have a great resource for teaching the Birch Bark House by Louise Erdrich because so many teachers said, I want to use that book, but I don't know how to say those words in there. So we have the audio of all the Ojibwe she uses in those books on here. Um, we've got a number of other contemporary songs and things as well where people have asked us over time for things. So this is, it's one place where we've tried to collect a lot of the arts and the songs, and I guess the other role that I think in terms of revitalization um, as a linguist, that's my background in terms of uh, what I got my PhD in, there is a fine art into knowing the grammar, knowing what you're saying and how it's working, and then teaching in a way that 
reflects that but doesn't burden the student. I don't ever want a student to feel like they need to learn linguistics to learn the language. It should be that if the teachers know how things are working, then what we provide in terms of curriculum, I mean, we don't talk about transitive and intransitive verbs. We talk about four verb types, type one, two, three, and four. You know, so they learn there's four different types. Um, but then we put that here because many people say, well, my auntie would like these lessons, or I've got a you know, sibling in another state or at another school. So we put a lot of things here that is the revitalization efforts broadly that are a little different than what we might do in class. This may be a silly question, but Good. <laughs> is, the, um, is the word for, I'm doing like this because I had to like separate it into syllables to try to pronounce it right, is the word for chickadee meant to sound like the sound of yes, a chickadee? Yes, yes, okay. I think. So we have the onomatopoeia, the same. Yes. Well, another one that's infamous in Anishinaabe one would be kuku kuku. So gidja gidja ganeshi and you know, kuku kuku for owl. There are some where it really is that language. I think many languages across the world, I wouldn't dare to say all of them absolutely do, but there are many instances where the word is based on the sound that people heard. Sometimes they're very descriptive. I mean, we have other words for birds that are more about what that bird does or how the bird looks. I also kind of currently have a theory that our future Dr. Kusharan probably would be able to speak about more clearly, but I do think that in um, Western science and uh, study of birds and plants, there tend to be more taxonomic, hierarchical naming conventions, whereas I think in our, uh, if you're using Anishinaabemwen, you will often find that entities, they, whether they're plants or animals, have more than one name. And they're often, there's one that describes how it looks and where it might be situated. Like it could be that the way that is named, it will tell you, it will usually be near tamaracks or in a swampy place or whatever. You know, it'll talk a little bit about that. And the other is um, sometimes it would have the, the use or the purpose. So it's as if things often have, I think, three different types of names. And I think that is, in some cases, you hear more than one name for an animal as well. I can think of that with birds, certainly, where I know we often have the tendency to want to say, oh, that's dialect difference. They say one in the east and one in the west. But I often wonder if the Proto-Algonquian before, or if we had just full flowing use of the language, uninterrupted in this space, would it be that you would actually know one bird or plant by several names? I, I kind of think that it might be, but like I said, there's other experts doing more work in that area. That <laughs> You know, Nick Rio at Dartmouth also talks a little about that. So we've been forced to often come up with a parallel, like the famous Huron-Smith ethnographies where you have a name in English, a sort of a taxonomic thing. But even in English, we often say, well, and then there's the folk name, right? Yeah, so, so I think that a lot of things have parallel multiple names. So when we talk about dialects, like Cree, well, I always relate to Cree because that's what I'm learning. So when we think of this, I understand that Ojibwe doesn't have the same cut and dry methods that Cree has for when we break apart dialects, right? We have words that are used right. interchangeably between dialects, which is one thing, but we also have certain patterns of um, um, replacing um, the consonant TH, you know, Y and N. Um, in Ojibwe, how do you, like, is this, is this website representative of one area of Ojibwe, um, where you're from? Those are good questions. <laughs> so let me like make sure I get all of them. Yeah. So one is this website actually, because I used to teach in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, and Michigan has really, it's fair to say, there are no longer Anishinaabe when first speakers who were born in Michigan. Most of the people that are fluent, proficient teachers in Michigan are from other places, many of them from Wikwemekong, some from Bekejwanong, um, other areas right near, but very much an Eastern dialect. And so there are things on this website that would reflect Eastern dialect. Um, being from Minnesota and having learned first in Minneapolis and then now teaching in Wisconsin, most of what I do now is all Western dialect. I would say that from like the sort of, 
I guess now, 25 years that I've been doing language work, um, there was a period where the people in the West literally said, we can't understand the people in the East. You have to pick. It's not going to be the same. And I think that what happened was people were so uh, separated and put into their one space that the folks in Red Lake had no idea they could absolutely understand the people in Chigang. They just didn't know it, you know. And so the early revitalization efforts, like my own books, if I look back at what I used at the University of Minnesota in, you know, 1985, it would be very clear that this was the senses, this is Red Lake dialect. But in essence, it was kind of spelling conventions, pronunciation habits, and different things that you could connect up in different ways. So for one, I guess I'm saying, across time the idea of what's dialect has changed. And then you're absolutely right. Unlike some of the languages where in the Siouan languages, the N's and L's switch, or like you say with Cree, where you can kind of point to, this is how we draw the line. People that use TH here, that's one group, you know, they do different things. Um, the easy answer in the dialects for Anishinaabe one would be the syncope, where people are skipping vowels. We call them vowel droppers. No, we don't really. <laughs> but they're very proud of that. It's they, they understand it. They can go past it. And it's actually a really musical, beautiful thing when you can just glide across some vowels and connect your consonants, but then know how to insert the vowels back in when you need them again later to add to your word. So they didn't really lose the sense of where are those sounds. They just had patterns of skipping them in some places, and they would come back when you fully conjugate the word in other settings. So that's a main difference that you see, and increasingly, we are all spelling the same. So I have friends that teach in Wikwemekwang who will now write out G-A-A-W-I-I-N. We'd see that on the page. I would, in if I were teaching in Minnesota, I would say Gawin. If they were teaching, they'd look at the same word and say Gain. So it's like the way we all look at pumpkin, and some people say pumpkin, and we all still spell it pumpkin, you know, or Minnesota with a D, but we still spell it with a T, you know. So I think that's the other thing that I see happening, is that um, the most full, complete use of all vowels as a spelling system has proven to be most useful for students. And if we create resources with the most expansive written version, it allows us to teach depending on the dialect range we're in. So you can still be in the East and say Gain. You just write it in a way that will be understood in all spaces. So I don't know if that's helpful. Okay. Ooh, Darren Crescene over here. That's <laughs> kind of question. <laughs> well, it's, it's not so much as a question, but a, um, a statement, and then I'm going to put you on the spot really mm -hmm. quick. Um, you talked a little bit about animate and inanimate, and I struggle teaching that to my students all the time. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so how I say it is, if it can move on its own, it, it's alive. And they're like, well, if you look at it from a scientific point of view, like, I'm like, oh my god, these right? kids. Yeah. Uh, There's the atomic theory, it's all moving all the time. Right? Yes, that's what they say. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, if you want to think about it that way, when you talk about the land, you can talk about it as animate or inanimate. And I said, because that is how we thought. We thought in quantum superposition. And I want to ask you, do you know how to say that in an Ojibwe, quantum superposition? Oh, that's a good... <laughs> Um, I don't know, I'd probably say something like be saw in them or something, you know? Something that implied theories that were in pieces or parts or something, you mm. know? Um, but it would probably need some gizha in there too. So gizha be saw in them or something, you know, something energetic or some sense of motion broken down, and but we're conscious of that. But then you could just say, Na Nagarawenda and Gijabi signed them or something like what we notice about energy that's yeah. broken down that we're thinking about. <laughs> so that's my answer. Na yeah, Nagarawenda and Gijabi signed them. I need to be able to express <laughs> that to my students. I was like, 
dang, these students are getting yeah, really and it is hard. It is hard to teach. You have to think about what's the setting, right? So we have in Milwaukee the Indian Community School where we teach multiple indigenous languages that are all in various stages of revitalization. And so we have people working on Ho Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, all in the same school, which is a challenge. And so you have teachers, teachers, and each teacher has an apprentice, and they're each at a different spot in language revitalization. What the Ojibwe classroom can do and stay fully in the language is very different when, than what, say, the Menominee classroom can do. Um, but I think some of it is just in practice. So there's times where you have to say Nawab Ma Minjikawanan, like, yep, that mitten, you gotta use the animate verb to see with the mitten, because you just do, and you just don't always have an explanation for that. Um, and, and so they, in that setting, they just get it through use. They just start understanding Ngamoa Mishiman, I'm gonna eat the apple, which is different than Gamijin Nopwin, I'm gonna eat the sandwich. So they just hear it, and it becomes habit. Um, and then when you get the adults, I think, uh, now, we're recording this, so those who want the translation can see me later. The story from Ashkabewis Journal, uh, Pajog and Minwa Moccasin, is also very illustrative of things that are considered inanimate, usually, suddenly being spoken of as animate. So you have nouns that in normal English speech you would be talking about them as if they are inanimate, suddenly they're having conversations with one another and they're all spoken about as their animate. So that's one that I actually use in my university level classes to just say like, you know, we gotta lighten up about this because I think that the elders who used it all the time had a real sense of humor, <laughs> clearly, right? So yeah, that's my answer on that, but it's tricky. So like to just um, thank you today. I was moved in so many different ways during your talk. Um, you got us to sing. And there is a lot of discussion around climate change, and we often don't hear from the land and the animals, and you brought that into this room, so miigwech for that. Um, and uh, I was just in awe here because I find you so talented in so many ways. So miigwech. Thank you.